Good morning, Rancho Bernardo. What a great day. We come into the presence of God and celebrate that Jesus provides us with rest, Jesus uh, supplies us with refreshment, Jesus supplies us with the light of life. We celebrate the goodness of God because God is for us, which is different than saying that God's on our side, right? God is for us. Let's have a prayer together. Dearest friend, we celebrate the truth of your love for us. We celebrate your guidance and the way that you speak into our hearts and minds, that we can hear you in our daily lives, that we can hear you at any moment, not just when we're seated here in this beautiful place, but anytime, wherever we are, that you can speak through your Spirit's presence into our souls and guide us into your way. And we pray for that. We pray for that guidance so that we can walk in you and become more like you. Lord, in all your goodness to us, we pray for your presence and the recognition of your presence by our souls so that we never forget. We always remember how close you are and how deeply you enjoy us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in our responsive uh, call to worship. Father, Lord of heaven and earth, gracious friend and constant compassion companion, we pray for you to lead us by your mercy. We are thousands of angels, always reflect the ex- exceeding glory of the King of Kings, celebrating you. Where there is no deep water, where there is true life, where love is strong, where the clear name of Christ rules upon his throne and where all things are made right.
Let's pray together.
We come with whole hearts, Lord, crying out into your presence, saying that we want you. We want to see you. We want you to be what we look for. So as we turn and open your word, we pray for its blessing on us, that we would see you in it, that we would recognize your voice within it, and that as we hear it, that we would place it within our souls and that you would use it as a seed that grows up so that we can become more like you. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. This is how we, uh, we've been taught to hear the words of God, the voice of God, and how the words of, of God came to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. And then we have Jesus, who just seems to be like this friendly guy, and, and people ask, well, how come we have this big ogre voice God in the Old Testament, and we have this friendly Jesus guy in the New Testament? How do you hear the voice of God in your soul, in, in your prayers? How do you hear the voice of God? When we think about Jesus and we start to put together this image of how God is in the Old Testament, how Jesus is in the New Testament, we can sometimes end up like kind of forgetting the God of the Old Testament and really liken the Jesus. A few weeks ago, I, I asked you uh, to consider listening and the importance of listening and how to particularly listen to God. In several weeks, we're gonna look into hearing the voice of God and discerning what God is guiding us into. But for today, what I want you to think about is What's the tone of voice of God? How do you hear God's tone of voice? I read a great story about a theologian named T.F. Torrance. Torrance was a theologian who uh, has come to be well respected as, he's, as uh, he moved through the last century. I love saying that, the last century. But in his early days, Torrance was a chaplain during World War II. And he came upon a young man who was dying, a 19-year-old, who was dying on the battlefield. 
The young man knew he was dying. Torrance knew he was dying. And the young man had a particular question. And he asked, is God really like Jesus? Torrance says that for him, this was like a cry of the human heart. And Torrance answered, yes, indeed, he is. He said, we don't have some big unknown God behind the back of Jesus whom we have to fear. He said, when we look into the face of the Lord Jesus, we are looking into the face of God. Torrance says that that conversation with that dying man challenged and shaped his ministry for the rest of his life. So how do you hear the voice of God? When you hear Jesus, do you hear the tone of voice? See, I believe Torrance is right. I don't believe God is some big ogre God in the Old Testament and that Jesus is suddenly this friendly other God in the New Testament. I believe we have the same God speaking to us throughout the entire Bible. I'd like to walk us into that because I am assured that Jesus is God's tone of voice. Jesus is God's tone of voice. We're starting a new series today and it's called Let's Meet God. I told you I was going to go over some basic stuff with you and to walk in the truth so we can just kind of walk along uh, for a bit. And in doing that, I just want us to look again at the words of the Ten Commandments and to consider hearing them in a slightly different way. To do that, the first thing we need to do is talk over the King James Version. The King James Version of the Ten Commandments is what we see on banners, on monuments, and posters, all sorts of places all around. It's, it's the big thou shalt not version. And the first thing we need to know is that Thee and thou, those words, were the way that people normally talked to each other. Like on the street. That's the way everybody talked to each other. You never used the word you, except in an extremely formal situations, and if you were talking to someone like the king. That's when you used the word you. Thee and thou were just the regular words for common people. It's the way you talk to your friends. It's the way you talked in the marketplace. In the 1600s, when this version of the Bible was translated, the people who did the translation wanted the readers or those who heard Scripture read to them in this new English version, in their language, to understand that God was talking to them the way they talked to people out on the street in the market that God was talking to them as a friend. Let that sink in for a moment. That the use of thee and thou was to teach people that God was talking to them like one of their friends. We've turned that completely upside down, right off. Along with that, we need to know and get clear that the word in Hebrew for commandment is translated in other places as instruction. Same word. Commandment, instruction. So put those two things together. That the Ten Commandments were supposed to be heard like a friend was talking to you and perhaps talking to you about instructions on how to live well. You should also know then that the Hebrew word for law is the word guidance. We've taught ourselves to hear the voice of God in a particular way. And in doing that, we may have missed exactly what was going on there. 
Now I want to say plainly here, I'm not making this up. We chose to translate the word as commandment instead of instruction. We chose to translate the word law instead of guidance. We made that choice. We chose to teach ourselves to hear the voice of God as having this demanding attitude. We chose that. For centuries, we've told ourselves that this is the way to hear God. Now, what's also interesting is that the word in Greek for commandment is also the word in Greek for instruction. In other words, all the way through the Bible, all the way through the Bible, the word could be instruction. When we hear Jesus say, I give you a new commandment, or teach them to obey all the commandments I have given you, it might be better to hear that as instruction. A new instruction I give to you. Teach them to follow all the instructions I gave you. It's a different tone of voice. Do you ever get an email from a friend and, and you think, whoa, they're mad at me? You get a text from somebody or, or some of us actually get letters. And you're thinking to yourself, what are they angry about? And so you get in touch with them and you ask them and they say, no, 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 no. This is what I was saying. And you, they repeat back to you the same words that you read, but they say them with a different tone of voice. And all of a sudden you go, oh, oh, now I get it. Jesus is God's tone of voice. I know at some point, uh, that, I mean, at this point, some of you are, somebody here is probably thinking, so why did we start calling them commandments? The thing about commandments is they set up two parties into a particular kind of relationship. And suppose you were trying to teach people that relationship. And that was the point, was to teach people to relate to God in a particular way. I'm gonna walk you into two incidents in the Bible that had a big impact on the relationship of the people of Israel with the God of Israel. The first one comes from Samuel, Samuel of the prophets. So in 1 Samuel 8, we read this uh, passage where the people of Israel come to Samuel and say, we want you to choose a person to be king and anoint that person as our king. Now up to this point, the people of Israel were led by judges that's where we get the book of Judges. It tells their stories. And the judges were selected by God. And they were people who were to give guidance on how to live life well. How to clear up disagreements. Samuel would have been the last of the judges. Even though he was also a prophet. He would have been the last of the judges. And God comes to Samuel and he says, don't get upset by this. Because they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. The judges would have been these people who have, would have helped people work through their disagreements. Would have helped people to deal with all of the stuff of life. Which is harder to do, isn't it? So the people came to, Israel, to Samuel and said... Everybody else has a king. We want a king. That's almost a direct quote from the Bible. Everybody else has one. We want one. And so they gave up this harder work of how to relate with each other, how to deal with each other, how to struggle through problems, to just get somebody who controls things, to just get somebody who controls life which is a lot easier. The second incident comes from the story of Nehemiah. The people got their kings. 
And some of the kings were good. Some of the kings led the people to worship God and to know God. Some of the kings, though, were kings. <laughs> and they wanted life to work the way they wanted it to work. So they led the people away from God. They led the people to worship idols. And that's where the prophets of the Lord came, came into play. And they show up and they start saying, stop doing this. You're breaking the heart of the one who loves you best. You hear that? Not, you're going against the ruler. The prophets of the Lord came and said, you're breaking the heart of the one who loves you best. But the people didn't listen. They went off, continued to, to worship idols, to follow the king. And so the prophets came back saying, you've got to stop this because what will eventually happen is you're going to get overrun by other kingdoms. There's bigger kings out there. And that's what happened. The country of Israel got split because of divisions and, um, and so there was a north and a south and then other kingdoms came in and took the north away and then other kingdoms came in and took the south away. And the people literally were taken out of the country. We call this period of time the exile. This is all in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra. And we find in that, that after a period of time, over 100 years, that the people were allowed to come back. And they were allowed to come back and rebuild the temple of God and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And after they were done with their building project, they were gathered together in a big place and read to by Ezra the, uh, the scribe. Ezra read them the law of God, it says, which is probably the book of Deuteronomy. And he reads to them, here are the commandments. And the people have these Levites who are there who are explaining this. And essentially, they're shown that, and told that the reason they were sent into exile, the reason they were kicked out of the country is because they broke the rules. They broke the rules of God. And they're told, essentially, that the rules were the most important thing to God. The rules are the most important thing to God. And so the people weep. They struggle and they come to a conclusion. And the conclusion is we will never break another rule. And they sign a binding agreement to never break another rule. In Nehemiah 9, verse 38, we read this. They, they sign a contract with God. You know the fascinating thing about contracts is that it builds a certain relationship. In other words, I do my part, you do your part. So if I follow all the rules, you have to let me into heaven. That's the contract. If I follow all the rules, you have to let me into heaven. There's no love there. There's no relationship there. It's just a transaction. So these people, sign this binding contract or agreement. And what happens at that point is two things. One goes into the past and one goes into the future. We're told that scholar, by scholars that at this point in time, they began to collect the Bible, the books of the Bible. Everything that we think of as the Old Testament began to be collected and edited right then, right around that period of time. So we want to find out what God demands and how God is demanding it to be. And the second thing that happened went into the future. In the future, what people did was they began to break the rules. <laughs> they signed this binding agreement, but like by the end of the book of Nehemiah, they're already breaking the rules. Like they've just signed this thing. And like Nehemiah goes away, he comes back, and they find out all the people are breaking the rules, and Nehemiah just throws up his hands, just says, Lord, just remember me. In other words, I'm keeping the rules. He ends up with these people who 
probably with Nehemiah and others, start to say, you know what? We don't care what any of those other people do. We're going to be people who follow the rules. So we're going to figure out exactly the right way to follow the rules. Because if the rules are the most important thing to God, we want to do it exactly right. And so over the next 400 years, these people practiced this and worked on it and studied it until there was a group formed that we call the Pharisees. So these two things happen. On the one hand, people began to put the Bible together, and on the other hand, they began to practice keeping the rules without ever breaking any of them. And becoming Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees? These are the people who Jesus had most of his problems with. Now, stop and consider that. If the most important thing to God is me being good, me being pure, me following all the rules. If the most important thing to God is rules, and the Pharisees were the best rule keepers in the world, trying to be perfect, why would they have a problem with Jesus? And why would Jesus keep getting into trouble with them for breaking rules? Because Jesus came to tell us that the rules are not the most important thing to God. The most important thing to God is us. The most important thing to God is us. Jesus came to teach us that the tone of voice that we thought God was using wasn't ever the case. That Jesus is the tone of voice of God. See, we've told ourselves that For 400 years, these people were in slavery. And then they were marched out into the desert where God said to them, now you're gonna be my slaves. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? That after 400 years of oppression, that God had Moses lead the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, out to the desert, out to Mount Sinai, to tell them, now I'm gonna be your ruler and you're gonna do what I tell you to do. So here are my commandments. Does that make sense? I mean, when you hear the words, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, does that sound like a ruler or a savior? How do you hear those words? I mean, when you hear the words, out of the land of slavery, don't you think that God meant out of slavery? We've told ourselves for centuries how to hear the voice of God. And what if the if God brought the people out of oppression and said to them, you're not going to live the way those people live who you were just oppressed by. I'm going to teach you how to live well. What if the words were experienced like, I have come that you can have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the tone of voice of God. So we're in this series called Let's Meet God. And I'm gonna walk you into remembering how much God loves us, how God is for us, and how the rules 
were never actually rules. They were the best guidance on how to live abundantly with each other. So I want you to hear these words again. I'm gonna invite Vicki up and she's gonna read you the words of the Ten Commandments in a slightly different tone of voice. I am Yahweh, your God, who took you out of Egypt and out of slavery. You won't be people who put other gods in my place, in my face. You won't be people who create idols to worship. You won't bow down to them. I don't share my place in your heart who sees how the damaged children do in their lives impact their children and their children's children and their children's grandchildren. I won't let that damage extend past the third or fourth generation. People who love me and pay attention to my instructions live in that love for thousands of generations. You won't be people who try to control me by using my name like it's magic. You won't be people who keep working constantly. You'll take a break every week. This is, this is the way I work. So I made the day of rest special, a time to set aside for relationship and rest. Treat your parents with respect and care for them in their later years. You won't be people who take others' lives. You won't be people who break others' hearts. You won't be people who take others' stuff. You won't be people who lie to harm your neighbor. You won't be people who focus on what you don't have that others do. You see, we weren't taught to hear this as wisdom. We were taught to hear it as commandment. And what I want to do is walk us into the experience of how God loves us and how deeply God enjoys us. And I need to say just one more time, I'm not making this up. <laughs> I'm not making it say something that I want it to say. I'm telling you what the words are and how we've chosen them to be. That we've taught ourselves to hear these words in the voice of God in a particular way. And that as we look at them again, we might hear them the way Jesus might say them. With joy. Let's pray. Dearest friend, Anoint us as your children, as those who know and celebrate you, who love you with all our hearts, and so, so relax in your presence because of your love for us. Teach us how to hear you, how to hear your voice, so that we sound like you do when you talk, when we talk with others. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we have certainly gathered in love today, gathered to connect, to hear Jesus' voice in our lives. And one of the ways we want to connect with you is through this connection card that you see in your pews. If you're a first time visitor, third time, 80th time, we want to connect with you. It also has a place for prayer requests if there's something God's putting on your heart today that you need special prayer for. Jesus told us to give with joy, with open hearts to give our tithes and our offerings for the work of his church. And so at this time, we invite the ushers down to collect our gifts.
I know you had me on your mind When you climbed upon that hill For you saw me with eternal eyes While I was yet in sin Savior, friend Every stripe upon your battered back Every thorn that pierced your brow Every nail drove deep through guiltless Let's pray. Healing, holy, and loving God, you who know every ounce of us, every aspect of our souls, every little twitch, Lord, you know us completely. You know the words that we have in our heads before we say them with our mouths. You know us. So we trust in you, that you also love us, and that you gather us to yourself, not only in this place, but each day, that as we awake, 
that you gather us to yourself so that we can go into whatever we face knowing that we are never alone, that we are never separated from you. Over and over you teach us that we are yours, that we have you by our side. And so, Lord, as we bow our heads right now, we praise and thank you for your goodness to us. We praise you that you have never forgotten us, that you've made a way for us to return to you and to live in you in fullness and in assurance. So as your people then, we pray in community and we pray with faith the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing about our friend, our friend Jesus, together. One, two. Oh. 
those words together, precious Jesus. Please be seated. I want to share with you some of what's going on in the life of the church. Uh, We have the closing of our nominations for elders and deacons. That's this Tuesday, August 31st. Uh, You still have a couple of days left to get your nominations in. Also, I just want to uh, let you know that our missionaries, Anna and Basho uh, Metri, are going to be out again in uh, in the courtyard. And if you haven't had a chance to speak with them to find out something about their work, please uh, take advantage of their presence. On September 12th, we have our kickoff. And so uh, everything's going to be starting at that point as we move into the fall. The, uh, uh, the, all the adult education classes as well as Sunday school and other things. And then um, I also want to just bring to your attention an annual report has been produced This one, as I I understand, you have not seen an annual report for uh, 10 or more years. Yay. (laughs) I want to thank Lee Kubro, who has done such a great job in putting this together. I also want to let you know about a couple of elements of this and something else. One is that um, on the, in the last couple of pages, you have the financial reports. These are the, um, the budget, basically, and short form. So you can see how our money is being used. But if you would like to know the complete budget, if you want all 35 pages so you can see where every penny goes, just ask me. (laughs) We will have it printed for you and given to you. Promise. Promise. We will just simply give it to you so you can have it and you can look it over. Um, But for most people, they don't want that. They want a simple budget that presents it. That's right here, along with everything else about what's been going on in the life of this church over this last year. So praise God. I want to also then invite you to celebrate with me the opening of our preschool. And I would like to invite Kim uh, Vandergrift up here, as well as the teachers that are with her, if they would all come up together so they can, uh, so we can pray over them and dedicate them to the work that they're gonna be doing. As they come, I wanna remind you, this is one of the major missions of your church. Up here, right up here, right up here, right up here. Just come right up on the top. And Kim, if you wanna stand at the mic so you can speak. Don't hide, just come on up. <laughs> you have something? Yes, Kim. Just really quick. I just want to say good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having us this morning. We are so grateful to be a ministry of this church and to have the opportunity to reach out to the community um, surrounding us and serve the families and share God's love with them. Please remember this, that these are the folks who tell the community at large that they have worth, that every parent, every child has worth, that this is an expression of our love for our community as well as our love for God. These are the faces that are saying that to some of the newest people in the world. So please join me and let's pray in dedication for these folks. Lord God, we know that children are a handful. We know that children require work and patience and understanding and creativity and insight and worth and value. Lord, we know that children need all of these things and we thank you for these people 
who are coming forward to take that role on and to bring that love, the, your love, into the lives of these people. We want each one of them to know how deeply we treasure them and respect the work that they do because it is demanding work. It wears you out. And so we want them to know that we are beside them and praying for them as they do the work that they do. We thank you for each one of them, for all of them who will be working in this place. We thank you for the grace that will be shared through them to all those who come, parents and children, grandparents, friends and family. We thank you for your goodness that will be part of all of this experience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you all. Just double checking that I got all the pieces then. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our constant companion, be with us now and be with us always. God bless us all. Have a great day.